throws it upset on Method PogChamp. Slute, Nagura, Championship Sunday begins. Hi, Nagura. Still on deck. Nope. <laughs> Back in Upper Kara we go. Now, we didn't really mention too much the uh, affixes in this dungeon. Of course, similar to what we saw yesterday, we will have Fortified, Quaking, and Necrotic in here. And Fortified, you know, Cyrus was talking how dangerous some of these bosses can be. Certainly, they can still be dangerous in that 24 setting. But there are a couple of key pulls on Fortified in this dungeon that are a bit scary. One of them coming up with that Arcane Nullifier, and then, of course, that Mana Worm pack after the Devourer. Yeah, we see both teams doing pretty much the same thing here as uh, both of the Holy Paladins use that repentance to go past those spirits and then we see both of the blood decays controlling one of the spirits and pulling those two uh, golems together as we see on Gal's Shutter's side. Method Pak Gem doing pretty much the same thing uh, just actually no they're skipping it with the, the mage skip so we see Dr. J going in a corner pulling everything using that ice block and now e he's either gonna die or using that invisibility to go uh, to go past those trash mobs. He actually does proc the cauterize so no death from him there but he will need a bit of healing support to make sure he doesn't flop over there. Gal's Shutter is opting to kill those two golems of course the trick here is you drag the golems halfway up the stairs tech getting quite low there he manages to get healed up you do drag those golems to the halfway up the stairs and then kind of jump over the side of the stairwell to not have to deal with any of that arcane discharge yeah, we see Method Puck Jump already on the next trash pull. Uh, they're also pulling some of those uh, elementals from inside the curator room outside, probably Elserat. The healer is just going in, pulling them outside so they can cleave it down with this big nullifier mob who has a lot more HP than everything else. And not just that, but of course that nullifier mob gives that damage buff to one of the uh, five members. Actually, I'm not sure if the healer can get it. I knew no, the DPS and the tank can get it, but one of them will be buffed with 100 or 50% increased damage for 30 seconds. And Method Puck Jam moving right along, already on the curator after the 40% trash pull. The entire room cleaved it down together quite effectively and they're working on the first boss. Yeah, so they're already in 40% trash percentage even though they skipped those two golems while God Shutter is of course still working on this pool uh, with the nullifier and elementals but the uh, curator here a uh, pretty difficult boss especially I mean it's uh, 45 but those sparks as you can see the volatile energy they actually their HP actually scales with 45 so it's quite difficult to kill them especially uh, if you don't have too much damage for one of them and you can get overwhelmed if you have two uh, of them at, up at the same time. Right, you are Nagura. Volatile energies and the zones on the ground being baited by the players, which is why you're seeing them kind of stick together as a group and play Ring Around the Rosy with our robotic boss here. Now, it is a bit dangerous, of course, with the quaking. Not usually the most threatening affix, but when you're stacked all five of you together like that, you want to make sure you're spreading out just a bit before it hits and then coming back in. Bloodlust has been popped for Method Pog Champ in preparation for the first evocation phase on the Curator, which will let him take 100% increased damage for those 20 seconds. Yeah, they might actually be able to one-face the Curator here, as we can see. Uh, using that bloodlust, of course, using all their cooldowns, as we see Dr. J uh, using, uh, all, uh, casting those pyroblasts, of course, and the boss is just melting. Uh, but of course, uh, it is a lot of HP, so if they don't manage to kill a quarter in one phase, they have to. Uh, make it or break it like they have to go either on the uh, energies or they have to go on the boss they have to make a decision yeah so he does have a fair bit of energy as Nagura is saying because some of it is scaled around that damage increase and now they will have to resume the phase curator will be doing more damage as will the jumps and the shocks from the boss as well volatile energies seem to be going down Nagura as you said so they're opting to play a bit of a safer strategy making sure that they don't have any spot deaths with those volatile energies gulch shutters has now as well on the left side of the screen pop their bloodlust and will be getting ready for their first evocation phase choppy getting down to five percent though manages to hang on and they're going to start dishing out as much damage as they can now and yeah, now you can see in method pop Gem side they actually choose to ignore the volatile energies now on they spread out they're trying to get the jumps from the volatile energies as spread out as possible so that the, the whole group doesn't get hit by it and they just nuke the boss down so they don't need this second evil phase and they're on their way to Medivh now and gold charter is getting curator down about 15 percent lower than method pop Gem after that first evocation phase so a huge huge amount of damage coming out from them. They'll be done with the boss soon too, allowing them to get a, a play a bit of catch up because they did fall a bit behind on that trash, nicely dragging it to the exit to make sure they save those precious travel seconds as they get ready to get into the same hallway while Method Pog Champ is already over on Shade of Mediv. Yeah, sometimes you see some teams uh, pulling some of the bats down uh, to kill them in between Corridor and Medivh because the cooldowns are not ready or they want to wait for their potion timer. But Method Pak Jim just going straight through, using that repentance on the map to go past and just going straight to Medivh. Medivh here, of course, as a solely casting boss will have three schools of spells. We will have the uh, the frost, the fire, and the arcane. Arcane, really, they're just appearing, uh, piercing missiles just on the tank there. Can usually eat a few of them to the face. Inferno Bolt will leave a dot on you, but you can dodge it. Of course, you have a blink or a disengage at the last second. The most important one here is the frost to interrupt, as it will trap a player in an ice block, and then you need to get them hit with one of those Inferno Bolt circles and uh, accrue the dot on both players as a result. 
Yeah, so uh, we actually have set rotations of those extra faces. As we can see, it's always arcane first uh, on the tournament server here because, uh, of course, we want to reduce as much RNG as possible. So both teams are going to get this arcane phase first. Uh, it's almost impossible to skip the phase. You need an insane amount of damage to do so. So people need to, do, need to go through this arcane phase. And those birds actually scale with 45 as well, just like the volatile energy on Corridor. So it's actually not that easy to deal with. Yeah, so they do do increasing damage during this Guardian's image phase. Method Pogchamp deciding to play it safe and kill one bird at a time to kind of make Elserat's life just a bit easier. You can, of course, try to split damage on two or even three of them, but the damage starts to get pretty out of hand on this 24 here. They finally down the last Guardian's image and wait for Sh uh, Shade of Medivh to spawn back in the middle with that first Frostbite being cast. Gullstrotter's not too far behind. They should be entering their first Guardian phase soon as well. Yeah, we see Galstrutters, of course, uh, pulled that Pyromancer, which uh, teams usually uh, try to avoid, especially because it's fortified and it's quite difficult to deal with uh, those orbs that spawn. So they are on 49% enemy force as well. Method is only on 40%. So later on, we will probably see Galstrutters skip some ups that Method Pogchamp actually has to kill. Method Pogchamp now at 33 on Shade of Medivh. We do have those Flame Reefs coming up soon, if I'm not mistaken. There they are right now. Muscle Bar getting quite low. Hopefully doesn't get that Flame Reef. He does on him at the last second, but he is able to be healed up before Elsret. If anybody crosses these fire rings or dies within them, it will explode and essentially wipe the group immediately. A fair bit of damage comes down on those DPS in the meantime. Shella, not too much damage, uh, not too much danger for them, of course, as a Warlock on the outside. They can drain through a lot of it. Yeah, Quaking, of course, also a little bit dangerous here on top of that Flame Wreath. And uh, to be fair, Method Popchamp uh, does have uh, fewer interrupts than Galstrutters has, because Galstrutters, of course, has two melees, and melees usually have a shorter cooldown on their interrupts. And Medivh requires a lot of coordination, a lot of interrupts. Uh, if you get one of those casts through, you might just wipe the whole group. So good job by uh, Team Method Popchamp uh, getting all those interrupts through and cleanly killing Medivh here. Muscle Broad just passively regening some <laughs> of that HP quite low. Of course, the Windwalker Monk does does manage to survive there. They do fall down the rabbit hole right now, having that immunity to fall damage. It'll be a bit before they work their way over to Mana Devourer. Shade of Medivh now at 20% for Gulch Trotters on the left side of the screen. Those two flames are quite close together. Pretty scary. Hopefully they don't clip the Inferno Bulls together, but they do finish and are able to move away from each other. Yeah, we see Method Pogchamp is, uh, of course, on their way to Medivh, uh, on their way to Mana Devourer. There is uh, a long falling way down, so it's going to take a while until they're all the way there. They also, uh, as I said, have less uh, trash percentage, so they might choose to pull one of those rats. But this trash here in front of Mana Devourer is actually very, very scary, especially on Fortified. Uh, and they actually, e even if they don't look very scary, those rats and those books are actually have very deadly abilities. So they might just choose to ignore them and go straight to the Mana Devourer. Especially in this Fortified setting. Nice cheeky little play there by them they do pop their um I, was, I keep calling it a swiftness pot, but they do pop their speed pot there, getting sure, uh, getting that slow fall as well, and kind of just caressing over everything. Sky potion, there we go. I don't know why I was called it speed <laughs> pot. It's not a speed pot, but Mana Devourer does get pulled over to the corner of the room. Actually, they don't go all the way to the corner of the room. Usually, you see, you see teams grab it right to the corner so that they can kind of funnel the mana orbs spilled out by the Mana Devourer so that he doesn't get as much energy and have that kind of lethal explosion that will wipe the group. So it'll be, be interesting to see how they choose to collect the orbs here because some of them will be spawning they do start to move it over now just before that orb phase probably wanted to plant and get as much of their burst damage out as possible without the boss moving too much yeah blood decays are very very good for to soak those orbs as they have the, the ams of course so we're probably going to see saps trying to absorb as, ma as many orbs as possible here in the first one and then uh, method pock time actually has a little bit of an advantage because they have dr j with another immunity while well, over for gal shutters they actually well they actually have the holy paladin and the uh, dk who can do it while well, method pock time is free immunities but uh, as it is a fortified setting it's probably not going to be that many faces so they probably are good with only the two immunities with the tank and the, the healer and we wouldn't be surprised of course here to see maybe a dps grabs one of the orbs on purpose as it will add a pretty substantial dot to the player but also give you a five percent damage boost so some players kind of like to live life on the edge like that and really output as much damage as possible but of course that will put some extra pressure on the healer big hit coming there on gold trotters as half the group dips to uh, most of the group dips to half percent of their health get healed back up and they're getting ready for their first orb phase method pog champ at 15 percent on mana devourer they really picked up a lot of that single target damage that we didn't see on curator definitely they have a lot of single target damage going in here as we can also see alcerat doing a lot of damage and shella as you said picked up one of those orbs 
uh, orb debuffs to do a little bit more damage. And as we all know, Wallock has a lot of self-healing, so Elsred probably doesn't even have to heal Shella this much. That's why they chose the Wallock to pick one up, and Elsred can still do his own damage while not having to look too much for Shella. So, of course, coming up is the kind of second trash pull that could go pretty sour here. There is a necrotic affix. The tank will get increasing stacks, decreasing the amount of healing that they can take. So if they pull everything in the room here, the tank's going to have to start kiting at some point soon. We see the AO grip come in pre-AMS to prevent some of those stacks. Gets as much threat as possible when they start kiting down the hallway. But these small mana devourers, exactly like the boss, need to have a lot of their orbs soaked. And we do see Shape DH and Dag go down on Gulch Trotters on the left. Three deaths now for them. They don't have that battle res available. They're just hoping to get Mana Devourer down before any more damage comes on the group as their healer is down. Yeah, of course, the healer is down and the, the Blatty Case is trying to heal himself up with the Necrotic Sacks on him. He probably ca can't use his AMS to get rid of the Necrotic Sacks as he needs it to soak those orbs as we can see them spawn right now. But now they just have to go all in as the Devourer is in 3%. We can see him, we can see the tank just kiting away, trying not to die, and we see the whole group dropping really, really low as, he, as the boss dies. A few bats being pulled here for Method Pogchamp because they do have some of that trash percentage to make up, as you mentioned earlier Nagura just safely taunting them down gripping them the only way they will come down is if somebody taunts them else they will sit there and just kind of shoot the uh, the swirlies onto the ground frontal here from the bats is pretty heavy as well so you want to make sure that you're turning them away from the rest of your party Gulch Trotters now doing a similar large pull with all of the small mana devourers and starting to kite into the hallway but they're already behind in the dungeon plus those three deaths once again we're getting to that point in the dungeon which is already quite progressed right now that they're just hoping that Mythic Pogchamp is going to have a wipe in order to catch up. Yeah, definitely. We can see uh, Gauss Shutters, of course, killing those mana uh, devourers here. And uh, they don't have the slow ring uh, from the Wallock as uh, Mythic Pogchamp has. And we actually see them drop really low. Oh. And there's actually a full team wipe coming in as those mana devourers, they spawn those orbs. And if they reach the mana devourers, it's actually a, an explosion. And especially with Fortified, it does a lot of damage to the whole group if you don't manage to slow them, uh, if you don't manage to kite them properly. Sometimes the orbs will spawn in front of them. So in the kite, direction where the tank is going and then it gets very difficult so if you don't have that much damage to kill them fast enough then this happens as we just saw with gulf shutters and this is actually devastating because they probably just use all their or most of their cooldowns their elite cooldowns to do this pull and it's going to be interesting to see if they try the same big pull again yeah i mean this is just what we we're talking about you have to soak those orbs well on the mana devourers i think they got some of them down so they're kind of dealing with half here scholar are getting a lot of damage on him right away not being able to pre ms as he used it on the previous pull but finally managing to stabilize and get it away as he dips really low there doesn't proc that uh, purgatory oh yeah, he actually does go down and shape goes down as well tech goes down this is an absolute nightmare for the gulch trotters right now they're just unable to get past this pack because they did use their cooldowns earlier method pog champ looking fantastic on the big screen here on the right side as they're killing the queen getting her down and then working once again on the king to make sure he gets below that 30 percent mark where he does not get his immunity shield again yeah this is a nightmare for gulch trotters 18 deaths and if you don't make this pull straight away as i said earlier uh, people keep releasing and they keep dying because the amount of the devourers are just walking all over the place the orbs are everywhere and they keep uh, exploding and you die as soon as you release as we just saw them uh, losing 18 deaths uh, most of them on this pool and we see shape dying again so they're actually having a lot of trouble doing this pool on the other hand method pop champ very clean runs so far zero deaths of course they managed this pool uh, in the very first try and here on the they're actually about as the king is about to die so they're on their way to the last bus already the king does go down and method pop champ is looking to turn this into a checkmate and tech take game one as one of them runs forward of course else rad the healer will run forward and start that rp event that will allow access to visit doom the final boss of the dungeon the remainder of the team the tank and the three dps will run off and finish the remaining six percent worth of trash by just pulling some of these easy bats from the sky making sure they get what's needed and by the time they're done the rp should as well be done and everything should perfectly sync together so that they start on the last boss yeah, we saw, of course, as I said, Elsrat uh, triggering that event, and then after those bats, they will have the 100%. We also saw, as I said earlier, those bats need to be taunted down, so we saw Masubra, the monk, go down, taunt one of those bats, as Elsrat, of course, is not here to taunt. Uh, but very well done by Team Pogchamp so far. I mean, it's a flawless run, right? They have zero deaths, just like yesterday. They have those really good runs where they, the, probably all this practice is showing just how flawless and how, how many times they practice those kind of things. Unfortunately, another couple of deaths for Gulch Trotters as they cross that bridge of doom uh, with of course the casters the overcasters and as well the melee add the eridar no full wipe there but again more time lost you're needing to res another five seconds on the board times two actually so 10 seconds on the board if I my mask correct finger if five times two uh, method pog champ does get ready here to pull visit doom the final boss of the dungeon and what has been otherwise a flawless run 
three phase boss, of course, will transition to his first ship at 66 and then the second one at 33 percent. Yeah, so of course, uh, there in the first phase still, we can see this beam being fixated on steps on the tank. So uh, one thing to note on, uh, with this beam, a lot of people always do this wrong, so I just want to note for all the viewers out there, if you're fixated by these beams, uh, you need to stand still, wait where the beam is spawning, because it could be in front of you, in, to the right of you, or in the back. So you need to wait and uh, see where it's coming and then reactively move, because if you preemptively move, you might as well, you might just walk into it. So we do have the first portal going down from Visit Doom, our eyeball boss, as he starts to float up to the second ship. Players will start at the opposite end of the ship and need to make their way down the ever so dangerous uh, kind of neck of the ship, avoiding some electricity or fell electricity, if you will, on the side of the ship. And of course, his beam shooting down there, which will punt players and can actually now punt them off of the remaining two phases. Yeah, so there's actually one trick uh, coming in that they might act okay they're not doing the trick but uh, if you don't actually step on this platform where the boss is uh, casting then the boss just stays forever in this uh, disintegration beam phase so if you have a lot of ranged uh, players if you have two or three range dps and you're doing a really high key then you can just choose to stay outside and just let the ranged players pretty much put the boss into the second phase uh, into the last phase because this second phase uh, the longer it takes it actually gets uh, more difficult we did see the bloodlust get popped there and a dispel on that first round of chaos orbs that goes on muscle bra everyone safely evades it making sure to dodge these swirlies on the ground which actually hit quite hard uh, somewhere in the two mil range uh, at this level visit doom will be getting to his th uh, third phase a second ship in this case as the players are ready there to meet him once again they will start on the opposite end of the ship this time needing to collect some fell lords and making sure to stay a bit spread because of that bad guano that will rain down on them yeah, so of course uh, this last phase, probably the most difficult phase if it uh, takes a long time as not only are there the additional ads that you need to deal with and the splash AOE, so you need to be spread out on the platform on top of the quaking and all the AOE coming in. There's also, also the disintegration beam of course that you need to take care of and there's the debuff that spawns the orbs out of you. It does a lot of damage so there's a lot of things going on at the same time, a lot of things to dodge, a lot of things to pay attention to. So. Uh, Method Prox, I'm doing a good job so far in this bus. Sub 10% now and a commanding first win here, or will be first win. I don't want to assume anything, <laughs> but Visit Doom does go down and Method Pog Champ will dominate this first map, taking the series at one nothing to start it off. Method Pog Champ continuing that trend of clean play. Fun statistics, six maps in the last two days, two deaths total. Uh, again, they are just looking absolutely terrifying if you have to face them. Yeah. I mean, they are. I have nothing else to say. That was just <laughs> clean, flawless run. You know, right off the bat, we were impressed with the 40% the trash. They, you know, had a bit of fun unconventional route. Most people do kill those golems at the start, but they just, they had their own thing going. They knew exactly where each person had to be doing, exactly what they had to be doing at the time. And it was just, it was flawless. Yeah, it was definitely very good uh, by Pakchem. Now, Gal Shredders, of course, uh, had a pretty clean run themselves up until the point where they had this uh, devastating mana devourer pool. And as I said, if it doesn't work out the first time, then it's just devastating as you don't have those cooldowns ready. Will Gold Shredders be able to rally or will Method Pop? Throughout the process of grinding up Legion, we kind of start meeting each other, like me and Shredder. This guy over here was always playing in plus and high skis as well. And the ones in the back, they just joined later, actually. Uh, me and Jay, we played with Sebs earlier. Like, we knew he was solid. So when the time came around for, like, MDI, me and Jay creating a team, it's like, okay, we need a tank. And then Sebs is actually, like, the first person we asked, I think. Yeah. And he said yes, so that's good. The deciding match in the upper finals versus Shells, when we won that series, it's just like, we're going to America. That was a great <laughs> feeling, yeah. yeah. Obviously, playing from home is completely different. Like, you're put it, uh, getting put out of your comfort zone. On stage, everything is basically different. You have cameras, you have uh, lighting, uh, the angle of your chair is different. Uh, like, very small things can make a difference in how you play the game, basically. To be honest, for me, it feels like we're actually more efficient here than from home. Because there are some teams that practice less than we do, but they feel forced to play more efficient. They kind of might want to adjust some things like i can tell you that we adjusted small things because like we had so much practice at home that we had our strats set up but when we came here we realized okay we can clean up this and this a bit more and and other teams gonna do the same for sure do you feel any love or hate to the other method team it's all family like we love them and uh, we have a really good time with them in, in the end we're still competitors yes. yeah. it's all fun actually like the, it's really cool to chill with other teams like it's a really good experience for me at least. Nail in the coffin. Speaker, I don't want to hear 
single punter in this dungeon. Just want you to know that both teams raring to get out of the gate here. We'll immediately pull all of these 10 trash mobs prior to Hindle together, as is pretty standard for them. A lot of champions here, but really the Thunder Callers and the Dragon are the most dangerous here in Agura. Yeah, so the Dragon has this uh, one huge lightning breath that uh, he casts uh, towards uh, his front, like it's a front of a cone. So sometimes you see the healer, for example, just the taunting this Drake away, so it's less scary for everyone else. And as we can see, them all pulling pulling everything together, mass gripping it, of course, and the tank is starting to kite now. As, as we know, if the tank is kiting, if he's out of range, they just, as, as long as he has aggro, then the mobs will try to follow him, will try to get in range, uh, and they won't cast anything while doing so. A fair bit more damage coming out of Gulch Trotters as well, as they only have the Drake left right now. Lower health than does Method Pogchamp as they finish off their last Thundercaller. Not too much difference, but these seconds really start to add up as they get ready to pull him to all the first boss of the dungeon. Like to remind those at home that we are of course in that tyrannical setting now and there's some very dangerous bosses in this dungeon even himdal himself the first boss can pack quite a punch with his horn coming up in just a second you'll see the entire team of gold shotters chunk down quite low making sure everyone's topped off before that otherwise it could spell disaster yeah, we saw one team actually had a full team wipe here on himdal uh, last time around so hopefully that doesn't happen for those two teams we see method pakcham now on the bus as well uh, obviously both of the teams using their bloodlust uh, of course gold shotters is a little bit ahead as they when they did this trash pull, they just had so much damage, and we saw them uh, kiting the mobs towards Himdal. So as soon as this last trash mob died, they were ready to pull Himdal and uh, go. Very well done by them indeed. Chompy doing well to bait those blades out away from Himdal, making sure there's no threat to the melee, because once they do land, they kind of circulate in a small area. So you don't want them to accidentally clip the tank or the uh, DPS, of course. The other danger here outside of the Horn of Valor is, of course, there is a huge frontal, as we saw the bloodletting sweep on the tank, which, if a melee finds themselves at the wrong time in front of the boss, can be lethal. And we have actually seen that in this tournament as well. So you want to be careful where you're moving the boss and when you're moving the boss with these drakes coming down and making sure you're communicating well to the melee definitely usually have one of the range or the shot caller just looking where the dragons are coming from and pretty much like telling the team where to go so if it's middle first they have to tell the team if they go right or left with the bus so everyone is on the same page but both of the teams are doing a good job so far and uh, it's interesting to see how gal strategies is going to do in this map especially it's be because it's their pick and they just had this this one mistake but it lost them so much in the first map it's going to be difficult for them to pull themselves together and just give their best in this dungeon here i hope they do just that will remind everybody as well that we are in kind of uh, we have the fell explosives affix as well which both teams are decently equipped as tech does go down on gulch trotters we'll get back to the affixes in just a moment off to use that battle res even though there's only 14 percent left on the boss the team once again gets distracted as we saw yesterday with skyline d tech going down perhaps their minds just weren't there for a moment as they battle res them somebody probably didn't call the dragon out coming down through the middle lane and two more members go down their battle res is down they still have 11 percent left on the boss as as the encounter does end at 10%, but without the two extra DPS, this is going to take a long time, Nagura. This is going to cost them so much here to finish the boss fight with uh, only one DPS alive. We saw Tick actually dropping really low on that Horn of Valor, and this is exactly what we've seen yesterday, where one of the member members dies, and they probably uh, distracted, they're freaking out uh, on their voice comms, and then everyone, no one called out the dragon, and then two more people died to that uh, dragon's breath, and now it's going to cost them so much time as uh, Himdal is on 12%, uh, it's only one da damage dealer alive. Fortunately, for their sake, they do manage to finish off the encounter without a full wipe, which would be absolutely devastating. They'd lose the bloodlust and have to pull again, but they do manage to get out of it. The two DPS release, and they're getting ready to pull the same trash pull that we're seeing from Method Pogchamp as they wait for that Sentinel to go up. They pull the three plus the six up on the stairs, which I believe equals nine, and they will grip everything together, making sure to silence it, blanket silences and stuns on top of all these thunder callers and, of course, the menders, which can if they get a heal off, it's pretty much over here. Yeah, so we see on Galstrader's side, of course, there's a, a quite a, a, a few of patrols are with those sentinels, and the patrols always start as soon as you enter the dungeon. So when those teams are practicing those runs, they obviously uh, think that it's going to go the perfect way, and then they know exactly where those patrols are. So uh, this vibe actually might have even cost them their strategy, as the patrols are in different positions, their cooldowns are ready differently. So th th that's why we saw them wait a little bit uh, before they started doing this pool. But they have recovered now, and they actually managed to do this pull properly 
as we can and see them cutting and dying. And nice advantage there with the Boomkin as well, Nigar, I'm sure. Of course, you know that that solar beam is really huge in this dungeon, comes up really big for these big pulls, especially with all those casters in there. So solar beam doing a lot of work for the Gulch Trotters there as they move downstairs and grab only the one Sentinel. I hope that was intended because they were kind of back in it. It was intended, okay. So they do have two Sentinel pulled here, just like Method Pog Champ. We saw them do that yesterday. So pretty mirror pulls in terms of trash here for the two teams so far. Yeah, and if you think about it, uh, Gulch Trotters and Method Pog Champ pretty much the same up now. Of course, Method Puck Champ is a little bit lower on those Sentinels, but uh, if they wouldn't have had those couple of deaths on the first boss, then Gal Strutters definitely would be ahead at this point in time. So, uh, unfortunate for Gal Strutters, but there's obviously still a lot of time left in this dungeon and they can still catch up at this point. Not too far behind, indeed. Gulch Trotter is now working on that last Sentinel. They, of course, don't have the little kind of benefits of having the spell steal on the shield for the Sentinel. So just a bit of extra health that they'll need to chew through as Method Pog Champ is rearing up to do that same massive pull we saw yesterday. Now, the scary thing is uh, for this team right now is not that they don't know how to do the pull, but it depends where these orbs spawn and how well they handle them based on where they spawn because you can LOS or line of sight them around the wall and also down the stairs depending on the angle you're at. But a lot of these going off at the wrong time and the wrong angle can finish the team off as we see one of them does hit the team there. Yeah, Method Pogchamp, of course, uh, doing this big pull as we uh, were the mage, gets the buff from Elserad, he goes to the left, uses his sky, uh, sky step potion, pulls everything back. And uh, again, I have to mention that they just have this wall up with the slow ring, which is so good for those kind of kite pulls where the DK steps just uses the gateway. That's one thing that the wall up provides. And then he also provides that slow that is just so important to uh, not get into range from steps and also lose less time because the faster they run the more the, the longer everyone has to follow them around and the further they are away from their next pool. Absolutely textbook there from Method Pog Champ as Dr. Jane Muscle Brawl light the pack up. Shella does his support with the slow and of course we saw Elsrod well running after the pack there killing any orb that spawned immediately. Method Pog Champ just like yesterday will be heading over to Fenrir first waiting for that bloodlust cooldown to come up so that they have it available for Herja, one of the most if maybe not the most dangerous boss in this dungeon. Method Pog Champ just moving around the side, getting ready to start that phase one on Fenrir. Gulf Charters looks like they're going the opposite direction and we'll be starting with Herja first. Yeah, they're, so they're pulling those Shield Maidens and the Purifier with uh, this mini boss as we saw uh, Method Pog Champ do yesterday. It's a pretty difficult pull because, of course, uh, it spawns explosives and explosives spawn explosives themselves. So it's uh, difficult for the tank to deal with uh, all those uh, cleaves from the Shield Maidens coming in and having to tank that mini boss as well on top of the Eye of the Storm that the mini boss casters. Uh, of course it's uh, not fortified so the mini boss are not buffed but it's still a difficult pull to do. And it, it takes a while as well. Method Pog Champ, as we saw yesterday, did pull a bit of the trash with the Falconers on top of Phase 1 Fenrir here. As long as that bull isn't in there, it's not too threatening. Just making sure you cleave everything down. Everybody nicely stacked around Fenrir now to make sure that they split that AoE cleave from the boss. Otherwise, the tank would take maybe just a bit too much damage and perhaps plop over. Omir finally being pulled for Gulch Trotters, the, uh, the second mini boss that is required, of course, to spawn Herja. Yeah, so the second mini boss got pulled as soon as the shield maidens died. Uh, of course, they have a, a lot of uh, damage dealers that gain damage or they're uh, very good at two target cleaving especially Moonkin as we can see him do 6.2 million DPS on this pool here and uh, interesting to note that their bloodlust is still on like a, on a 2.5 minute cooldown and if uh, Himdal would have died faster then bloodlust would have been an even longer cooldown so it's uh, interesting that they choose to go to Hersha especially because they don't have a battle rest left now and they don't have the bloodlust and Hersha is one of those very very difficult fights on Tyrannical and she does take well method pog champ does finally push Fenrir over, but they still have a bone to pick with him. We'll be running over and chasing him down into his den right now, making sure he doesn't get too far. Last time, yesterday that is, we saw that they only pulled the one warg extra with Fenrir. That gave them enough percentage to add 15 more before they went upstairs. So only need that extra warg, which is why we saw that water walking. Actually, they ended up... Oh, no, that's the, those are the packmates from the boss. Yeah, so only one extra trash mob for Method Pog Champ here as they re-engage with Fenrir for phase two. Yeah, so the, we saw the leaf come out of Fenrir here. We saw uh, everyone spreading out, probably have set positions. They know exactly uh, where you have to go. Fenrir also jumps to the furthest away target first. And uh, there's a trick you can do with a mage. If you use your invisibility in a certain moment, then the jump will actually get interrupted. So he will not continue jumping. And uh, of course, if you get hit by the jump, then you get this bleed debuff, as you can see on Elsa right now, for example. And people, of course, try to avoid this jump. They try to use their blink abilities or their teleport to not 
not get hit by it because it does quite a lot of damage. And it does splash as well, so the players want to make sure that they're spread out as he does leap around again. Elsrat going into the cave, not just to see who let the dogs out, but also to make sure that he's spreading out, not getting any of those extra bleeds on the players. Gulch Shutters has finally engaged Herja. We'll have Bloodlust available in 73 seconds. Not sure if they're going to opt to use it, although at that point, Herja's probably going to be around 70, 65%, something like that, so it would probably still be pretty beneficial for them. Yeah, so they get one battle rest back up, so they can have one member die and uh, still uh, get them back up and recover. But uh, as you said, this boss fight takes a long time on Tyrannical. It's uh, a very difficult fight uh, as well. As we can see, those expel lights coming out on the players. You need to spread out, and it does a lot of damage on top of the arcing bolt that happens on the left side. And one arcing bolt also gets cast while Hersha is on the right side here. So sometimes it can overlap, so the expel light plus the arcing bolt can overlap on one of the players. And it does a lot of damage, so you need to make sure that you plan your defensive cooldowns accordingly. Method Pogchamp now at 13% on Fenrir. Fenrir should have no problems wiping up uh, the rest of the boss, of course, not them <laughs> wiping up, I hope, but they will be wiping up the rest of these mobs and cleaning the boss, getting ready to head over to the same wing that Gulch Trotters is on as they enter their next lightning storm phase, the Eye of the Storm there. Now, the Blood DK can support with Leech every single storm, as the storm is a one-minute uh, cooldown, essentially, for Herja and the Blood DK will do it every 45 seconds, but technique does go down with that lightning bolt there did not manage to get a defensive off just does so much damage and pretty much gets one shot from a hundred percent right there they go over to the other side as you mentioned Nagura, they did have access to that battle rest which they have pretty much had to use right away now this is going to be a big problem for them later yeah, they do have their bloodlust ready. Uh, thankfully, they didn't use the bloodlust before Tick died, so the, the, the monk can still get the bloodlust up as soon as they use it, unless they choose to save it. But at this point, I would play it safe if I was them and would just use that bloodlust because, as he said, they're out of battle rests here. And we saw Dak uh, actually earlier, before the Eye of the Storm, got hit by that combo by the Expel Light and the Arcing Bolt, but he used his bubble just to be safe and survive. But uh, usually, yeah, this one Arcing Bolt where Tick died to after the Eye of the Storm is one of the most dangerous Arcing Bolts because you just got this whole AOE in the whole group. Everyone probably used cooldowns or defensive cooldowns for the Eye of the Storm, and then this Arcing Bolt just does so much damage. So usually we see healers running something like the Fell Shield emitter and using it for this Arcing Bolt just to be safe. And not to mention that, of course, the longer she stays on one of the sides, the more stacks of that type of damage she gets. So of course, she's on the nature side there for a long amount of time, does a ton of damage with that Bolt as they bounce back over to the holy side. Method Pogchant right now cutting back across this mead hall, getting ready to move over to Herja, pulling the remainder of the trash that they need. Want to remind those at home that before you kind of have access to the light bridge, you only need to have 84, 85% trash because the rest of it will be completed by killing the four kings upstairs. Yeah, so ha they had uh, those uh, middle trash pack, this middle trash pack here left, which I believe the last time they actually pulled the middle trash pack while they did the, the big hallway pull on the left and right. So they chose to do a little bit of a smaller pull, I believe, but uh, the, on the way they just they were just killing it and moving on to those shield maidens, probably doing the same thing as we saw Gal Shutters do earlier and uh, Method Pakchamp themselves doing yesterday where they pulled those shield maidens to, uh, with the mini boss. And of course, you can see all those explosives spawning in the back. You can't line of sight or even outrange the explosives, but it is a pretty, uh, pretty uh, long range, like 60 yards or more. Herja does go down for Gulf Trotters as they start to hurry along over to Fenrir side, which we've already seen Method Pogchamp complete. They too are doing a similar pull here with the Shield Maidens plus Solston, the nature uh, mini boss that is needed to spawn Herja. Once they get those Shield Maidens down, which pr do a particularly devastating amount of damage to the tank, as you can see, Seb's kind of frantically kiting around in circles right now. Uh, not only do they do, do they do an MS or uh, kind of Mortal Strike, old school terms, debuff here that will decrease the amount of healing you can receive, but they also decrease the tank's armor, so kind of a double whammy that you don't want to deal with there. Once they die safely, Olmir is engaged from the other side of the map and brought over for some play. Yeah, we see Gals uh, here still have a, a lot of trash to do in this hallway. We just saw the Blood Decay go in with the Bob and the uh, Sky Step Potion, pulling everything together, uh, mass grip, and now we can see him kiting, using that W uh, backpedaling here, <laughs> yeah, just so he stays out of range. Of course, they don't have the well luck for the slow, but there's a couple of other things you can do to slow those mobs, especially, uh, for example, Dimas, which is one of those tank trinkets that actually applies a 70% slow uh, in comparison to a well luck with only 60%. Did you say backpedal with W? 
Oh, is that an OSS? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you're scared. It's the kind of crazy European keyboard that you have. Method Pogcham about to down Solson in just a moment, working on Alamir, doing well to kill any explosives that come up. And, you know, a bit of a damage buff, of course, for Shella in these situations where not too many of those orbs are spawning. Wants to make sure he dots them up as well. Gulch Trotters moving over to uh, Fenrir. They already have the percentage they need. I think they'll probably do a similar route where they're going to pull Fenrir here cut across the water and then only deal with one more of those wargs. We'll have to keep an eye on them. Soon enough, Persia will be spawning here for Method, though. Yeah, I can bind my back pedal wherever I want to slide, okay? So, <laughs> Method Procham is uh, on the way... You have to hit me when you say that. <laughs> Method Procham is on the way to Persia now. Of course, they do have their Bloodlust ready. They also have two battle races, as their run was very clean so far, with zero deaths coming in. So, they have this safety net of the battle races for Hersha, as we saw, of course, Gallstrader is losing their monk uh, w to one of those arcing bolts, so it's a very dangerous fight. But uh, as, uh, as soon as they pull the boss, they also use their bloodlust, as we can see, uh, the first arcing bolt coming out on Shelly, dropping really low, and we see the first eye of the storm. Yeah, well. I mean, those monks are just so vulnerable, quite monk s situation, if you will. First lightning storm comes down, getting ready to be punted to the other side in just a moment. Certainly don't want to accrue too many of one of these uh, spell types, the nature, of course, or the uh, holy on the other side, because Hersha will just essentially one shot anybody at that point so that's why you always bounce her between the two sides as soon as she gets out of the tether beam from one side she starts to lose her stacks of that damage type and stack the other one instead unfortunately these days there is no sweet cheese point where you can kind of just move her between both sides and she doesn't gain any stacks those days are far gone Hersha now working on her sanctify on the holy side the team doing well to dodge it so Galstrad is, uh, is done with the first phase of Fenrir. They're on their way uh, to uh, pull the boss again. They're going through the water here. Uh, they, of course, they have 84% uh, enemy forces, just like Method Pogcham. That means they don't need any more additional trash. So they're trying to avoid uh, all the war games here. They're trying to avoid all the wolves, just going straight to the boss here. Yeah, and you know, Galt Strutters, despite their kind of issues, isn't too far off of... Uh of Method Pogchamp right now. They, of course, have the four deaths. Those are always a big deal when you're at this level of competition. They get the imprisoned down on that org. They don't need it, as you mentioned, Nagur. They have all the trash, and they finally use their Bloodlust here on Fenrir, so they should be able to catch up a bit. It's going to come down to, once again, the deaths in a few seconds, and once we get upstairs, it's quite linear. Four kings, boss, boss, that's it. There's not a lot of creativity that you can really do up there. We do know both of the teams will be spawning those four kings with the beers, but uh, for, uh, at this point, it's just who's going to mess up and who's going to pump out more single target almost. Definitely. We saw Galstrutters doing that skip through the water where he did jump up this edge and uh, Tick the Monk actually failed it three times in a row, so I thought it might be a repeat of Method Pop Jump's Aya for sure. I lost but count after two. <laughs> but he managed to get up in the end, and as he said, using the Vladas here for Fenrir uh, in comparison to Method Pop Jump, just using it for Hersha, of course, which I believe is a little bit safer, but maybe it just didn't work out with the, the way they wanted to do the dungeon and with their cooldown timings and so on. I do still think at this point they'll probably still both have access to their Bloodlust at uh, Odin. I, I don't like you wanting to say his name differently, but Odin nonetheless upstairs. Uh, so they'll both have it available. I mean, both of these teams have practiced ad nauseum in this dungeon, so I'm sure they're aware that they want that third Bloodlust at some point. Persia now down to 20% for Method Pogchamp, but Technis going down again for Gulch Trotters as he ventures just a bit too far into the cave. That spelunking trip cost him his life. Yeah, I think Fenrir was actually fixated on uh, Tagmong, which is very unfortunate for them, to be honest, because uh, the, if the Moon King gets fixated, he can just go there for it. If the Demon Hunter gets fixated, he can probably just dodge a lot of those uh, melee attacks. And Techniques just doesn't really have anything. I assume that the Bob was not ready from the Holy Paladin, and they don't have this battle rest. So he was kiting Fenrir, he was going inside the cave, but the very last millisecond of the fixate, the boss reached him and just one-shot him. So now they have to finish the rest of the boss fight with uh, only two DPS. I mean, if they didn't have that safety net with the bop, Shella goes down as well for Method Pogchamp. They'd opt not to use the battle res, which I think is a good call there. Obviously, I mean, Hersha had 3% when he died. No point wasting that battle res. They want them available for Skovold, which is another boss with some of those one-shot potentials. In fact, we actually saw Shella die on uh, uh, Skovold yesterday when they had to do Halls of Valor, so they know it could be quite dangerous. But, you know, the technique situation here, I mean, if you don't have the safety net of the bop or the sack, and you know you're getting chased as the monk, he could have transcended back outside of the cave once Farron Rear was in any relative danger of reaching him. So, could have outplayed it just a bit there, but it does cost him a bit of time. Fenrir now down at 3% for them, and Method's already heading up the bridge. Yeah, thankfully, uh, they're going to be able to finish this boss fight without techniques, because uh, the less people there actually are on this boss, the more difficult it becomes, because uh, he does have this cleave that uh, shares damage, and we see Shape dying here as well, but thank God the boss manages to die too. So, they can release and spawn at the entrance, and they get the lightning speed here, so they're on their way to the last, uh, to the last two bosses as well. 
Uh, they're grabbing some extra trash right now. I don't know if it's on purpose to kind of die and go to the beginning of the dungeon. I'm not Probably. sure. I'm not sure why you do that at this point because you do get the speed buff. Oh, uh, it's because they didn't have the Demon Hunter, I'm pretty sure, on the way back to imprison the bull again, so they knew there was no way around it. Once you get in combat, you cannot use the portal to get back to uh, kind of the Halls of Valor area. So they had to eat the deaths. Uh, so that death at the last second on shape was actually even more costly than you would have thought, not just one person. And this is just kind of the problem we we're talking about that Rob mentioned earlier. Gulf Trotters really needed to clean up a lot of these spot deaths, and they're just not showing that they've done that today on their own counter pick here. Nonetheless, they do finally stealth or invis past those two sentinels and finally head up the bridge themselves. I mean, uh, if you don't think about the deaths uh, from Gulf Trotters, if you just think about the pulls that uh, they've done, uh, it was their map pick, and we've seen Method Procham do this exact same uh, map already, and they were pretty fast. We saw Method Procham do a very clean uh, House of Valor, so when Gallstrutters chose this map, I figured they must have something up their sleeves, they must have a, a faster time than Method Park 10 because they have seen them do it, but I haven't really seen any special pool, any like crazy pool where they can make up this time, and of course, as I said, this uh, just not so clean play where they just lose a player here and there, it's just costing them so much time. Tough to deal with this ironed out Method Park champ group as they work to finish off the last two kings, making sure to quickly move them out of that corner as some more ancestors spawn, of course. Those ancestors will heal the bosses for 10% should they reach them, but it's also an excellent opportunity for the players to proc Cephas with some of the CC that they could put out. Uh, there is one more king in the back, and of course, every king you kill will spread his uh, buffs to every other king, giving them their abilities, including that sever on the tank and the daggers out on the DPS, which can hit quite hard. Yeah, the dagger does quite a, f a bit of damage. Of course, uh, Tyrannical does not buff the mini bosses, so it's uh, a little bit less impactful. But uh, if you're a cloth where like Shelly and Dr. J are, the uh, dagger might still do a lot of damage. And uh, we've seen the bop coming out of Elstrad earlier as well. Maybe uh, they need to use some defensive to survive those dag daggers, as we see Seps actually just kiting those mini bosses as they do quite a lot of damage, right? Yeah, the sever can stack on the tank. We see that little kind of axe icon on it, Sebs. They're just axing in question right now. But it can't stack too. It's 20% damage per uh, severed debuff. So you want to make sure that you can avoid it, of course, parry and dodging. But you don't want to get too stacked on them, of course. Just a bit too much damage on the tank can get out of hand. Don't want to pop that perg or anything like that right before Scovald comes out. Speaking of which, we start now the RP for Method Pog Champ. Scovald finally runs down triumphantly and is quite angry at Odin here. Yes, Kovald also won uh, of the more difficult boss fights here in uh, Halls of Valor, on Tyrannical especially, as he has one of those uh, very difficult abilities to deal with, is a foul blazing charge. So we can see most players just go very far away, especially if you're, of course, if you're a ranged player, if you're a melee, you don't want to go far away. But we, we will see Shelle and Dr. J just stand on pretty much max range, and if they do get targeted by a foul blazing rush, then they will use one of their abilities, like the blink or the port, to dodge it. Because if you do get hit by the foul blazing charge, then you're probably going to die or drop very, very low. Uh, this is the fight where you want to dump all your battle reses if you need to, obviously, if things go bad. You don't have an opportunity to use them on Odin later. Muscle Brawl eats that first Felblaze charge right there, dips down to 21% HP. Probably had a CD ready for it. It does quite a bit of damage. Ragnarok now starts on Scovold. Huge pulsing AoE damage on the group. The trick here is to pop the shield at the very last second as Ragnarok's starting. That way you kind of get immunity to his next special ability should it be a charge. That time he chose Savage Blade. Tank needing to have active mitigation up for that. Nothing too difficult there. Scovold now does pick up the shield though afterwards and gives the players a bit of extra difficulty with those flames. Yeah, so he spawns those uh, flames that uh, do leave behind those pools on the ground and as, lo as long as they're alive, they also spawn pools in random directions in the room as we can see them spawn here. They do quite a bit of damage if you stand in them, so you want to kill those flames as fast as possible while still, of course, uh, keeping your distance from the boss, dodging that Bell Blaze Rush as we see Muscle Bra getting hit by it again. They're probably just rotating cooldowns on Muscle Bra as we can see the sacrifice actually here on Muscle to survive. So the healers and everyone needs to be quick on their reaction time to see who gets fixed by the Fell Blaze Rush. If it's Muscle Brad, then they actually need to rotate their coolness and also had good reactions here using that sacrifice so Muscle Brad doesn't die. Poor, poor Windwalker Monks just needs one <laughs> babysitting, but does survive there, no problem. God King Scovold about to hit halfway for Method Pog Champ, the next Ragnarok coming up. Fell Blaze Rush once again absorbed into that shield. Well done by them to pop it late. Gulf Shotter is not too far behind. They finally as well started on King uh, God King Scovald here. So about 30, 32% separate the two teams. But that's a lot of percent in this tyrannical setting on 24. 
Definitely. We see, unfortunately, God King Skovald threw his shield into all those paddles, and then uh, Musselbra had a hard time attacking the boss because, of course, uh, you need to attack him behind the shield. Uh, the shield itself uh, makes him immune to damage, so you need to go behind. But since there were the paddles on the ground, Musselbra had a hard time. But, uh, of course, they're so far ahead at this point, and Musselbra is still topping the damage meters, so monks, you know. Mudag just got <laughs> down to like 2% health there when one of the Fellblaze charges on uh, Gulch Trotter's side managed to hang on just in time, though both teams continuing to chisel away at a chisel away at God King, another Savage Blade coming out for Sevs. No problem for him having his active mitigation ready. 25% on Skovald. They'll probably have one more Ragnarok phase here and then one more Flames of Woe. They're using the space in the room really well, making sure that they don't have any threat of some bad spawns with these Fire Elementals either. Yeah, to be fair, uh, Galstrad is here on 50% on Skovald. As you said, uh, it looks more than it actually is because it is tyrannical and uh, Method Poctum are on this fight for probably almost three minutes at this point, so it does take a long time. But uh, they did catch up a little bit, and uh, I'd like to say if Method Poctum actually wipes either on this boss or on Odin, then Galstrad still has a chance to catch up here. And, you know, that's... that's that's what it's going to take at this point with yes. Method Podchamp. They need to wipe in order for Gullstrutters to stay alive in this tournament. But with Method Podchamp, how they played yesterday and today, and how they've played this map so far, it's just, it's going to be really hard for that to be the case, especially Skull. I mean, o Odin has a bit of danger to him for sure. If you get caught in the AoE, you can mishandle the ad, etc. But in terms of just unfortunate one shot abilities, there's just not as much potential on that fight as there is with Skovald and Herja, something that they've already gone past. Yeah, Odin, of course, uh, does have this one act cast that if you don't interrupt it the search, then it will pretty much cause a group wipe. So uh, that's one of the more difficult parts to handle. But uh, as you said, Method Pactions are just so uh, well rehearsed and they've done, they've practiced these dungeons so many times. They have, uh, they coordinated their interrupts, their stunts, their uh, everything. So it's going to be uh, surprising if they actually manage to wipe on Odin here. It will be surprising indeed. I was very surprised. Uh, Odin, just a bit of RP here as they start to talk to him. He will start at 100%. Muscle Brawl likely equipping that Cynodaria belt, benefiting for extra damage up to 90% or down to 90%, I suppose, on Odin. Now, the Odin fight actually ends at 80.5%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you actually you actually have to just DPS him down a bit, but each percent represents the same raw HP as another boss, so don't let that fool you. Chompy does go down over on Gulch Trutters, as does God King Skovold, but again, just another death you don't need. A bit of time lost there to uh, on the boss with four manning the last few percent, and of course the five seconds on top of it, Nagura. Yeah, so they chose not to use their battle rest. I mean, it was only three percent left, but uh, you can't use your battle rest on Odin anyway, as uh, you just get teleported up uh, on this balcony, and you can watch the rest of the fight. So you can't be battle rest on Odin, so they should have just used it, even if it's only for the last three percent, in my opinion, but they chose not to. They did manage to kill a boss now, and they're uh, on the RP waiting to engage Odin at this point, while Method Pakcham used their blood as already as they're getting their buffs. As you can see, the, the Valkyries here uh, just nuking the boss, and the boss is on 92% uh, already. Yeah, so that Valkyrie buff, or I suppose it's actually technically a debuff, but nonetheless, it gives you a 50% damage and healing increase for 30 seconds, something that you certainly want to line up with your CDs pot, and in this case, Bloodlust for the team, as they just chisel out as much damage as they can on Odin, looking to clean this out with another 2 0 win. Gulf Shotters themselves have as well started on Odin. Yeah, just very clean run again by Method Pactum, just having this one single death from Shelly on Hersha. And as we said, uh, sometimes you might just be very unlucky on Hersha. Getting those uh, combos in, getting the Arcing Bolt and the Expel Light, that's probably what happens to Shelly, just running out of defensive cooldowns. And other than that, it's just a flawless run again by Method Pactum. 5% left on Odin here, while uh, Galstrader is still on 96%. And not only that, they also have 8 more deaths, so 40 seconds difference as well. Yeah, Method just now heading over to their second round of Valkyr buffs does well to deal with the obliterator there making sure they interrupted and none of those surge casts get out and I mean great Odin's beard we're going to uh, have another 2-0 here on our hands in a second now I know Rob's slightly looking at me saying the game's not over yet which you're right it's not but it's about to be in just a moment here as Method Pogchamp are getting ready to clean this up with a 2-0 dominant win and we'll be heading over to face Shell's Angels an admirable performance throughout this entire tournament by the Gulch Trotters. Uh, certainly looked a little bit better on their map pick. Even with the deaths, it felt like it was still fairly close, aside from maybe the death differential. Uh, but yeah, Method Pogchamp continuing that miracle run through the lower bracket. I'm actually just beginning to wonder if they wanted to be there intentionally, just so they could make a better story out of this. But uh, really well played by them. A little sloppy by their standards with that one death, but hey, we'll allow it. 
Have you not seen Dr. J's Twitter? Or, uh, and he definitely wasn't happy to be here in the lower bracket, but how, with how much their play has improved uh, from that first day to these past two days, what is this now? Three deaths only across uh, six dungeons. It, it, absolutely phenomenal. Even better than Skyline D's showing in the group stage. Uh, you know, they went through that dungeon so fast. Ghost Trotters picks this dungeon because they saw, hey, we've seen these guys do this dungeon yesterday. We can do it faster. And Ghost Trotters had a pretty good time in here yesterday.